queridos, how is it going? All good? All good, querido. All good. Have you been, have you been enjoying Coachella? You, we were talking about it a little bit. I've uh, been watching a bit of Coachella. Yes, I have to be honest. It's, it's actually it's actually fun how they have integrated everything, you know, the live version and the, and the streaming part. It's actually, it's, it's very cool. I'm like yesterday I was with, with some friends just watching, I don't know, Kate Tranada, uh, Blink-182, Blondie. I, I, I loved it. I love the whole concept of, of it, the, the aesthetics. I kind of, I kind of, I kind of feel thing. sad. I kind of feel sad though that Blink One Eighty Two basically canceled all their shows to, in Latin America because of like uh, some issues regarding like a uh, bone like being broken or something. But yes, yeah, it seemed pretty cool. Like, so Travis, I was like, mm, Travis Travis Travis, something like, like that. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's just that, that's another topic that we can discuss about later. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, another issue, Max, welcome to Madrid. Thank you, now, my friend. You are back home, so I hope you have a beautiful trip. You are back home. And on the most important side, we have a very keen mind of the music industry today, which we are very, very excited. During the day, he's a strategy manager at SoundCloud, but during the night, he's fighting the good fight as a writer. Back in the day, he used to write for Music Business Worldwide, Pitchfork, New Yorker, Rolling Stone. And now he's the founder of the newsletter Penny Fraction, which he's been running since 2017. And this is an issue that is being delivered to over 4,000 people across the industry every week. And if you don't follow it, you should, because if you are into the whole analysis of the music industry from a digital standpoint, you should check it out. For all the trans and Eurodance and euphoric pop lovers, he's starting to throw parties uh, called uh, hula hoop parties in Brooklyn. And I've been following his work for a couple of years now. Got the chance to meet him in person and talk about the industry over a coffee. And I'm very excited to have him here in the podcast. So please, guys, let's receive David Turner with a big round of applause. How's it going, David? Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. It's going well. It's, yeah, it's a very sunny day in Brooklyn right now. So I'm excited to come in to talk to you all this morning. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for joining us. So uh, just to start things, talk us a little bit about yourself. I give people a little bit of context. Yeah, totally. So yeah, so I live in Brooklyn. I work, and as you said, I work at SoundCloud. I've been at SoundCloud since 2019. I've had a number of roles at SoundCloud. I originally started on the curation team. So I was helping come a lot of sort of the ideation of sort of the playlist strategy at, Sound, at SoundCloud back in the day. And now I'm sort of a strategy manager. So my role is kind of to help with doing sort of internal, external research of sort of competitors and sort of other industry trends that are sort of going on, reporting on those for my boss and other folks in, in the companies that help make, help make decisions. And then also sort of like sitting in on sort of things around sort of like around sort of licensing discussions. So it's a kind of a little bit of a sort of a catch all sort of different things. And then as you said, I've been doing this newsletter penny fraction since 2017. So getting close to, I guess, over five and a half years. And it's been a really fun newsletter. It's like, giving me a lot of opportunities to one, meet folks across the industry where I get to have real conversations like, like, like I had with you only a, like maybe like a month ago, not even yeah. that long ago. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And then I, and then, yeah, then I get to meet other industry veterans who've been in the industry for like, sometimes I meet people who are like, Oh yeah, I got started in the eighties. And I'm like, I wasn't even alive then. That's kind of fun. <laughs> you're reading my work. And then I also get to meet with like college kids who are like, basically like, should I, what should I do after school? And I'm like, oh, let me try to give you the best advice I, I can get from my vantage point. So it's been a really, really great sort of experience doing the newsletter. And I've also really liked what I've gone to do at the top of this year where I've written six newsletters so far and all of them has sort of been about looking really deeply at the different streaming services. So starting with Amazon and then going with like Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, Deezer, um, Tidal, Pandora, just yeah, and then other international ones as well. So it's been a really like, Sort of fun start of the year for me in terms of like the work that I've been doing. Definitely. And I loved it. And one of the things that I, now that you just mentioned that the whole research that you did about the, the streaming services, also I went through and if you guys uh, listening out there are into the history of how like labels were like came to be as how we know them right now, uh, David wrote very interesting uh, pieces about Warner, about Sony, about Universal and this, the history that these major labels carry on. But today we want to talk about a very interesting issue in the music industry, the streaming crisis. You've been writing for it for a while now, uh, and I cannot think of a better person to discuss this with. And here I want to start things a little bit different. I want to start things with a quote from Meredith Rose on her paper, Streaming in the Dark. And I want to direct that the final question of this quote to you. So it says, 
the music industry has settled into an equilibrium with the new digital landscape, is no longer reeling from the shock of technological change and has found a sustainable business model. So why doesn't it feel that way? Yes. So why doesn't it feel sustainable? So I think one thing to sort of think about is we, if we go back to around 2015, 2014, it's sort of the shift that sort of started happening where all of a sudden streaming started growing and growing at a rate to sort of start usurping sort of digital downloads and sort of starting to offer, to sort of offer a potential sort of like reprieve for the fall of physical sales. And I just want to sort of say again that I'm, I'm based in the US. I often talk very broadly about things from the sort of the US perspective. So this is not when I sort of talk about physical sales sort of declining and stuff, that is actually not sort of applicable to other markets like Japan, Germany, and other places across the world. So I just want to be sort of clear that like often I'm talking about a very US point of view. So basically in the mid 2010s, it sort of seemed like streaming was sort of offering sort of a sort of substitute for the previous sort of revenue streams of sort of physical sales and digital sales. Um, and so over the last, I guess, seven, eight years, it's every year streaming has continued to grow, 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 and grow. And as it's continued to grow, we've also sort of seen as a consolidation of streaming into really basically four companies now, where you have 90% of streaming revenue comes from Apple, Amazon, YouTube, and Spotify. And because of that, you end up having this sort of situation where it looks like the industry is much healthier because all of a sudden you have this increase of revenue. You have people paying money for music. It is the, like via subscription and you make it basically sort of can sort of see this sort of like bigger trajectory where it's like, okay, things are now sort of getting to a sort of a much stronger point. What I sort of have wanted to challenge and what I've wanted to sort of start poking at over the last, I guess, six to nine months of my newsletter is basically trying to like look at those four companies in particular because they represent 90% of revenue. And in just for context, streaming represents about 84, I think, percent of revenue, at least in the, the US. So if those nine, if that 90% come, if those four companies represent 9% of the 84%, then basically most streaming, like st those four companies basically represent like three fourths of all industry revenue. So like the health and sort of the vibe of those companies is very important to understand. So to go very, very quickly, it would be that Apple Music is to me, one, Apple has been very involved with music for decades. I don't really feel like Apple is really that interested one way or another of leaving music, but also doesn't seem to be that much more keen into doing major investments in, in, into music and in, in the other music streaming app of Apple Music. And like, it has playlists, it has video offerings, it has like documentaries, but it isn't like trying to do anything that innovative. It isn't like sort of revamping itself in the way that you see a, a Spotify. Amazon, fairly similar. It has a smaller market share than the other three, but has sort of found sort of a niche one. It has the cheapest streaming option. And again, it's sort of one that's become very preferred by listeners of like country music and other small niches. And then you have YouTube, which is massive globally. But the issue of YouTube that everyone can not everyone that folks in the industry understand is that like it's been really struggle. It's struggled to have paid paying subscribers. It's been doing a lot better at that recently, but. The massive growth of YouTube across the globe and it's sort of the amount of listeners and users that it has makes it sort of a really like hard to sort of ignore um, sort of player in the space. And the last one is Spotify. Spotify, which is in some markets the biggest streaming service and it's certainly within Western markets sort of the big player, also is one that I sort of keep an eye on because it is it generates most of its revenue from paid subscriptions, even though people talk a lot about like the advertising and talk a lot about like what it, what it sort of means that you're sort of giving all this data to Spotify. Most of the way it makes money is via subscriptions. It's like 90% of revenue comes from subscriptions. Advertising, it's an advertising margin. It barely makes any money on its advertising business. So like in many ways, I kind of, I kind of increasingly sideline the advertising business. I think it's kind, not a red herring, but I think it's something that like folks traditionally have probably talked too much about in lieu of just sort of the, the, um, the revenue. So I guess this is a quick, a long way of sort of saying the reason why I'm very keen on this is because over the last year, all of these tech companies have started doing layoffs. So you've been seeing layoffs, yeah. sort of cost reduction at Amazon, at Spotify, not yet at Apple. Apple has been sort of the one that has held out. And I think that's basically also because Apple sells physical goods. They are not sort of a sort of software or advertising based company. They sell physical goods and those physical goods sales of like iPhone products, maps and things have not sort of seen the sort of like on the sort of shakeup that it's hit other parts of the tech industry. And then you also have Spotify who also had layoffs, who had layoffs recently that particularly have taught, that really have hit some of their podcasts and some of their other previous investments that they've made the last couple of years. So to that original question that you asked, why I sort of started raising some more questions and talking about the sort of like scare quotes of a crisis in music streaming is because I sort of see that there is a increase of 
unsta- like instability within these four major companies. And I don't think that that means that stream that music streaming is about to go away or that folks are going to be less interested in it. But as you sort of see more instability in these companies, and if you see a slowing growth of streaming in, in matured West, Western markets, and you're sort of seeing that growth also sort of not be actually sort of fulfilled in sort of non-Western markets, particularly in Africa and the Middle East, it sort of makes me kind of question a little bit of the narrative and sort of the like, the sort of the um, business sort of case that the industry has made, be it the major labels or the streaming services themselves over the last decade plus. I, I love the fact that like you you gave us a, like a huge picture in in really like low time because like many, as you said many people look outside and it looks very the grass looks very green but when you start getting cl- closer to the grass you you see it's like it has some some holes and some things so like I, I really like really appreciate that and like I also recommend my our audience the penny fractions because I also read the the articles about the platforms you mentioned um, and I wanted to ask you like given exactly on this picture that you just um, draw to us. Do you think like the model is going to be able to adapt? Because I was thinking like when I was preparing the episode, I was thinking we are sort of trapped in a kind of a prisoner's dilemma or game theory, if you will, like where because streaming came out to solve piracy, right? Like in, in, a, in a certain way where like so it had to be cheap. But now it is so cheap that you, you're the business is not um, the business is not like sustainable or it's not it doesn't make any profit. It, it's it's yeah. made profit like just recently. So. Like how, like, I guess the solution is not just rise, rise prices because if probably like people will unsubscribe or anything. So the question is like, do you think the model will be able to adapt or, or how will it, will it evolve? Do you see the model like itself surviving in the, in the music industry itself? Yes. So I think what's interesting, I think this is actually something that market by market, I think we're going, I think ultimately market by market, we're going to start seeing more shake out and a little bit more changes. So one thing with Spotify is if you look at Spotify's sort of quarterly report, like sort of quarterly earnings, they as a business should be profitable and could easily be profitable. The way that you make Spotify profitable to give unsolicited consulting advice to Spotify sure. X is you just cut sales, you cut sales and marketing, you exit out of basically a third of the markets that they've launched in recently, and you probably just try to slightly change up your licensing deals. And that's basically it. And you have like a fairly profitable company because Spotify, again, for, just for clarity, is that in the United States, in, in the Nordics, in the Nordics, in the UK, in Western Europe, and I think in probably a, probably a decent amount of Latin America as well, they have enough subscribers to sustain the business. It is what Spotify's issue to me the last couple of years has been they've kept expanding. And, it, and again, this has taken two fronts. One is the podcast where they invested a billion dollars, over a billion dollars into podcasts that get people like Joe Rogan, Michelle, like the, the Obamas, the Mark, like Meghan Markle from like the UK. And they've also bought like a number of like different startups. They've been like hundreds of millions on different like um, startups in that space. That's like a lot of money that they spend that I have yet to see the return on. And obviously you make, you invest money to make money down the line. You don't expect an investment of that to turn over immediately. But if I have just sort of look at their finances, I'm like, I don't believe that some of these prospects are working. I actually just saw a story earlier today that Hurdle, of an app that they bought that was like a, a, like a, a music game where you would guess a song. They already shut that down. And they've also like shut down some of the podcast stuff they bought. So it's like, why did you buy this? And then ultimately shut it down within like a year. Like uh, you just wasted money. Like it's not even like a, you clearly wasted money, you made a bad investment. So I think in that sense, Spotify, if it made a few tweaks, could be functional. And also the ads business for streaming services is one that I, I guess I have like a few like more aggressive opinions where I do think that it could be more better refined and a little and be a bit more frictive and try to push more people to subs. Also, you mentioned raising prices. I think raising prices is ultimately in markets that can do it and that can afford it will need to do it. That will have to happen at some point as well. So that is to say that I think like in certain places, I think streaming can work and will ultimately be the thing that continues to exist down the line. I think in other markets, I'm a little bit more unsure. So I listened to a podcast earlier this week that was by the Economic Times in India, where they basically asked the question, will streaming survive in India? And I thought it was a really good one because this is something that I've noticed when I've been looking and doing more research into X, into more like Middle Eastern and more like sort of Southeastern sort of streaming platforms. And just kind of noticed, I was like, these don't make money. They don't seem to also have that high level of like 
user base. Like they don't seem to have like attracted enough users to justify the amount of money being thrown into them. And also, again, when similar tech companies across the globe are making these cuts and looking at their budgets, part of me kind of wonders, I'm like, is it really worth it to keep investing like tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars into these companies where it doesn't seem like it'll be possible to really like make this work in these particular markets. And it may just be that there may need to be a different rethink of how digital music is going to work in these other places. So that's kind of like my like sort of like sort of short answer to, I mean, I wasn't that short, but to to answer your question. And just to follow up on what you were saying and, and to expand, because it's not about pointing fingers here to the people out there that is listening to us. It's, a, it's about finding the whole, how, how the whole structure, getting into the pipes and, and, and looking for uh, where the things are getting stuck. And when you mentioned about the, the, the investment side that Spotify did on, on podcasts, what I felt at that moment, I was thinking like, what are they doing? What are they doing? Because they are so close to music. Uh that they can actually jump over the middleman, which in this case would be the major label. Mm. But that was back then when I was having a, a, a whole understanding of the industry. But now when I look back, I, I feel that they were trying to get out of the stronghold from the major labels when it came to licensing. Because major labels, they have like a non-fungible token. Music is a non-fungible token because if you want to listen to, I don't know, Lizzo, you cannot get another Lizzo. You have only one music from Lizzo, right? Yeah. So you kind of have a certain specific monopoly that, and, and you have advantage, you have a strength, you have a, the, the leverage to actually force a, the license over, or, over a, the DSPs. And what I've been reading is that sometimes when DSPs go and, and license, if there is a surplus, at the end, the label is the one who takes the surplus from the DSPs. So just to expand the conversation that you were uh, mentioning right now, yes, the, the DSPs are trying to look into different ways of finding, uh, not relying only on, on, on music. TikTok started doing it very recently, which by the very end, it seems like, okay, you are losing focus from the important thing, which is music. But I feel that they are only staying quiet just to lose that stronghold and have yeah. a little bit more of space to breathe when it comes to finding profitability. Yeah. So it's it's funny because I think narratively that makes sense because I just think that like, okay, so I guess this is kind of funny and I guess and I, and I guess I kind of have like a hard time squaring the circle a little bit. So as a streaming service, it looks really bad if like, two thirds or 70% of your revenue goes to something that you can't, that you have to always give. That just is a really bad business. It's just like one that doesn't look like one that people would like to invest in. But I don't know what the other option is in terms of the streaming platform, because I don't, so I, Spotify briefly tried to do distribution. Um, and that kind of got like, sort of like pulled, pulled from under them. Also just music distribution is not like that great a business. There is a story in billboard maybe four or five years ago at this point, I've talked to a lot of smaller distro services and basically pointed out that it was like a fairly like low margin business. It wasn't like one that was like super sort of profitable and was one that inquired, like required a lot of investment. And it really wasn't clear that like it worked well because like if you're distributing music and ultimately you aren't getting the Taylor Swift of the world and you're mostly just getting a lot of sort of like bedroom producers, and you're just not going to end up, you're not going to end up making that much money. And then as you have more and more companies in that space, the va- the cost that you can charge those people to distribute their music is going lower and lower and lower. So it makes it even harder to run that side of it. So that's like one like theory that was thrown out there that Spotify tried that got pulled back. And then I was always skeptical about podcasts because like I've listened to podcasts since like the, the mid 2000s. And like I always thought podcasts were like a failing niche product. And so, and I think I still feel pretty right in that because podcasts have grown tremendously, but they still are not a map. They are not replacing radio. And also just on a very basic historical context, podcasts could never replace radio because radio was an tr- invention of the early 20th century and was one of the first pieces of sort of like early mass communication. Podcasts are coming a hundred years later and are competing with YouTube, TikTok, like Instagram, everything else it's like i mean even like the idea of i would have to say that even like professional sports it's like podcast it's like like a hundred years ago 
sports as a thing weren't even that much of a concept where even now it's like you have all these different sports leagues you have all this kind of stuff like there's just like so much more stuff that for people to be entertained by that the idea that podcasts would represent a, a similar shift to radio back in the day just always felt like sort of specious to me and so to your point I found it really hard from the DSP point of view to figure out what those other options are for businesses that are not aligned directly to licensed content. You can look at ticketing, but again, ticketing is pretty, um, it's pretty consolidated. It's pretty consolidated. You could look at merchandise. Again, merchandise has, there are already plenty of businesses that do merchandise. You can look at more stuff like Patreon and, and Spotify recently announced some kind of deal with Patreon, like some kind of partnership with Patreon. I wasn't 100% sure of what that meant, but it's like, Patreon, I was just looking at this the other day. Patreon's like, rev- like the amount of money re- Patreon is generating, I think peaked out like somewhere last year. Like at least according to some of the charts I was looking at, it seemed like they had like the revenue that they were generating was peaking last in the summer of 2022. And the growth that they had during the pandemic kind of stopped around the summer of 2021, actually. So even that, I don't really think it's like a super viable model to sort of get into. Not that you couldn't like, do a little bit of all of these things and then just sort of keep building and stacking. But that again requires more and more investment. And are you a company that does music distribution or are you like a catch all company that does seven or eight different things and thus aren't able to do any of them super well? So I think that's sort of like the kind of like, I don't, again, I don't want to say bind or issue because again, Spotify, if it focused in on its things, I think could be running its business much better, but it may not be able to have the same level of valuation, the same amount of investment and the same amount of interest by share by stockholders because they would be like, this is a low margin business. It's able to sort of like eke out a small profit every quarter, but it's not going to be that sort of exciting for us potentially when we have other things we can invest our capital on. Definitely. And I think that we, we have, we have seen how like these different kind of content are now like impacting directly to like major labels, for example, you know, like because of the letter that Machine Grange wrote at the, at the very first beginning of the yeah. year, basically, it was like he like that letter made the entire industry started wondering about like, are we on the right track? Is it, you know, because like we 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 are a podcast, we you can find uh, white noise, you can find just like lo-fi beats, AI music made on Spotify. So that's like getting into the nerves of these major record labels. And it's like, but at the end, I feel that they are also kind of minding or uh, and only caring about themselves just now. But like, why now? You know, like, or like who decides why is this now a model that we needs to change or why, why did it, did it happen before too? Yeah. So I think it's pre. I think they're being preemptive. So I think the reason for why now is basically over the last two. Okay. Let, yeah. Let, let's take a couple. Let's go a couple steps back. So one thing I found interesting, and this is kind of a theory that I don't really I haven't fully substantiated, just to be very honest. I like keep looking at the data, but I don't I don't have it fully baked out. Is that I actually kind of think if you remember before the pandemic, there were a few like really notable examples of tech companies that kind of like went under or like had really big scandals of like we work in the United States and this other company, Theranos, which was sort of like supposed to be able to do like take blood without like a needle. And it basically was just like a massive scam. I think the person, I think that like Elizabeth Holmes was like in jail or something right now or something. It's like, yeah, it was, a, it was like a massive scam. And so what I thought was interesting was that that sort of started signaling that like the tech cycle that had been starting since like the great financial crisis of like the, of the late aughts was kind of hitting it sort of like in. It was sort of like people kept investing money into all these different startups and ideas. And we're clearly, we're kind of hitting the limits of like, good ideas or ideas that could make money. And we're just kind of throwing it into like really weird sort of like projects and schemes. And a way that I started seeing that parallel in music was a couple. One is that streaming was still growing. But if you look at 20, if you were looking at 2020 into 2019, there were slow rumblings of streaming growth starting to slow in like Sweden and sort of the Nordic countries and the UK where Spotify was sort of first to sort of debut and it has been around longer than it had been in the United States and it's sort of in sort of Latin America. And so that kind of made me go like, okay, well, maybe there's something kind of there. Then the pandemic comes and basically all tech companies see massive a- adoption during the pandemic. And you, I mean, we're on Zoom right now, pointing, like point in case. So like you saw this sort of massive boom for a lot of companies. And then what has happened, and I think has now become clearer to me, 
is that boom basically lasted around 12 months. And so around the summer of 2021, or if people remember the GameStop stock, like sort of like mania that happened, that is also probably another good sort of like peak moment. Is that around probably like February 2021 to the summer of 2021 was basically sort of like the sort of the boom sort of like starting to like fall apart. And we've been sort of on this slow decline since, which is why last year you saw the re like sort of the massive drop in tech stock evaluation, the layoffs hitting the tech company, the crash of crypto, like the fall of like a lot of NFTs, like the it, the metaverse being a thing for five minutes. And then all of a sudden everyone's like, don't remember that. We're talking about AI. It's like all of that, I think yeah. sort of spurred this sort of like massive sort of like, like all of a sudden where I thought things were starting to get rocky. Everyone forgot about it for 12 to 18 months. People were like, the boom times are here where everything's going to be great in tech. And then actually, no, it's not. And things are now getting like <laughs> back to a newer normal. And so you, to go back to Lucian's sweater, what I think happened, and this is my sort of guess, is that this was probably always going to happen in some direction. There was always going to be at some point a reevaluation of the current model of, of the pro rata streaming because the labels have been losing the share of this over the last six years. This is not a new trend. This is one that's been happening for a little while, for at least a half decade. And so because of that, I kind of think what happened was that over the last couple of years, the majors invested into NFT projects, some invested into metaverse projects. There's been a lot of like, like a lot of money put into those different back buckets. And I think right now you can kind of just sort of say in April of 2023, some of that stuff is just not going to pan out the way that they thought it was going to pan out. And I think to go back to what I was saying earlier, 84% of energy revenue comes from streaming. Thus, you probably should care about how that pie is being split and not get lost in the sauce of whatever is happening with these sort of more speculative assets and these more speculative sort of like technologies at the, at the moment, at least. At the moment, I think Granger's letter basically was sort of a, hey guys, he didn't say it like this, but like, hey everyone, for the last couple of years, we've been doing this kind of fun sort of thing of looking at these weird stuff. But actually, we should refocus our attention on how the industry actually makes money. And if we're going to refocus it, I'm going to start addressing these things like fraud and saying, hey, I see a lot of companies that are doing things that are eating into my artist's pockets. That's my pockets. I don't like that. Hey, I see a lot of these distribution companies that basically exist on volume. And I don't like that. Two, another thing is that like as these companies keep put, like putting out more and more stuff, it eats the bandwidth of DSP. So all of a sudden, a thing that Music Business Worldwide has been very good about is looking at like cloud computing costs that Spotify like has, which is, I, I kind of like think it's like a little bit, a little specious because I would like to have a little bit more clarity on if the one to one of that. But it is true that if you're ingesting tens of thousands of songs a week, each more, that it means you're going to have people who are going to be less focused on premium content. And the same thing is going to just keep sort of happening the more and more of that content sort of out there. So to me, the Grange letter was basically sort of a preemptive to go like, I don't like the way that some of these trends are moving. So I kind of want to start saying, we need to start addressing this now. And also to kind of say, hey, there's all this other stuff that's been sort of happening. But we need to focus on the sort of main revenue stream of the industry because that is going to be what is going to be carrying us forward. And I want to sort of like start demarcating the new paradigm now instead of waiting around till like the mid to like the later 2020s when all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, like there's just like a hundred thousand AI songs being uploaded every like day. The platforms are like, we're drowning in content. We don't know how to deal with it. And it just sort of gets a little bit more like mismanaged and, and sort of more mangled. So I think the letter was basically a way to sort of like preempt all of that and just sort of say, Hey, we sort of see the issues here. And also just the last comment is I think there's a weird thing that people do where like people misunderstand what happened with Napster and piracy. And people are like, Oh yeah, the labels didn't see piracy coming. They didn't understand Napster was coming, which is, isn't true. Like half of the majors were like fine with, with Napster. Half of them weren't fine with it. And also, if, especially if you live outside of the United States, you kind of would know that like labels have been like attacking pirates and piracy for decades. Like they've been like pretty hard about trying to get countries to not bootleg and pirate music well before digital, like the digital version of it came around. So it wasn't like they were unaware about the unaware of these consequences. So I kind of want to say this feels very similar to me where it's like, 
The labels are never slow to the game on these yeah. things. I think people are slow to realize it. And I think they like to believe labels are slow, but like they are always are pretty aware of protecting their copyrights and protecting sort of the main sources of, the, of, of their revenue. So that's kind of my like two cents there. Absolutely. Because like, um, yeah, like as you, as you correctly said, everyone should care how the pie is going to be divided and labels for sure are going to be the first ones to see if rules are going to change or how are they are affecting them. So uh, like we wanted to, like I wanted to dive a little bit deeper in like, you, you mentioned a little bit about, about streaming frauds because like mm. regardless of how the pie is going to be split today, we all know we have a, a pro rata model yeah. and like we know it's, it's divided on, on amount of streams. So like there, there are incentives for people to fake streams or to, so regardless of, of how you, Uh, divide the pie because I saw someone suggesting like let's let's instead of saying per stream let's pay per minute but then you could upload 20 minutes of white noise and then there's so there's always going to be some way of tricking the system but we, I wanted to ask you like right now and we wanted to know like your view on like the current state of streaming fraud with the model as it is because like I read an article and I can I'm gonna be completely honest. I can't remember if it was in Penny Fractions. I don't uh, remember though. I don't remember though that like Penny Fractions uh, warned of this issue long, long time ago before it raised like up the water. I'm I like I'm a, I'm a witness of that. But I don't remember like I read an article that said that maybe streaming like the fraud was around 10% of all streams were fake, something like that. So yes. I, I wanted to know like your your a big picture of how you see it on the nowadays model and, and current industry. Fraud is so interesting because I feel like I have like a very, uh, like probably like a slightly peculiar take on fraud, the same way I have a peculiar take on piracy. Um, so two, one, so yes, the, the number that is sort of banned about varies. I think France, so there's a, oh my God, not a company. In France, there's like a music think tank that I'm forgetting the name of as part of the French government that started recently that I wrote that me and two friends co-authored a report on music catalogs um, last year. And they did their own analysis of, of streaming fraud. And I think they said that they found it was around like three-ish percent. But I know that there are others that have said closer to 10%. I've heard like basically everything between like three and 10. Basically, it still amounts to like hundreds of millions, hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars. So it's just a significant amount. So I think the issue of fraud takes so many different forms because sometimes you have like basic streaming farms where people basically just make accounts, stream a song a lot of times, and thus they sort of like, And to your point, the pro rata market share, they just end up eating a bunch of market share via that. That seems pretty like, like pretty black and white. That's not great. You don't want to sort of see something like that. But you also, there have been numerous stories about how major labels have also done streaming fraud of where I think it was, I think Bloomberg even mentioned it. They were like, yeah, artists like Blackpink, the really big like K-pop artist. Or they mentioned it like a really big like Indian artist who also like sort of had fake stream. So I think that it is certainly not like And, it, and also another thing that I sort of sometimes want to always mention is that like streaming fraud, like I think of like K-pop stands, like when I've been like, I've been given some like docs where like it's the internal like, like um messaging for like BTS stands where they have like, yeah. here's how every streaming platform charts work. Here's the best way to make sure your streams are not going to be filtered out by their own internal algorithm. So you make sure to put your songs on a playlist. And make sure not, to, and it's like wild how yeah. much detail these fans will go. And then part of me is like, that's not fraud, but it's not authentic music listening. It's clearly gaming so they can get more money for their big favorite artists and, and game the charts. So like, it's kind of like a little fuzzy there. Um, so I do think that like streaming fraud is a broad issue is a very real one, but it is a little hard to one, understand who all the actors are bad actors are because I do think bad acting happens across the board. Basically, I think it happens from the DIY artist to the major artist. I think so. And then I also think it happens from the like small level marketers to more higher level sort of coordination on this stuff. And then, yeah, you sometimes have fans that are doing it themselves and if a fan's doing it, I don't really know how the best, I don't know like what in the current model you would say is the best way to police that kind of behavior ultimately because if fans are coordinating amongst themselves, like it's like, This is why platforms have ways to try to detect that. But if they themselves are trying to assert that, you just kind of sort of a constant sort of like um, cat and mouse sort of game there. So I think that it is like a very real issue. I think to me, the solution, if there was going to be one, would be some kind of sort of more like government mandate or sort of regulation yeah. around it. But I also am a smidge skeptical of that 
because I just find that like traditionally fraud and piracy when it comes to government stuff basically just kind of means like really like kind of long arms of sort of like certain like um, Western power just going into other countries and being like, we're going to persecute these people for like stepping on American copyright. And I'm like, okay, I don't know if I fully want to like just give full credence into that as well, especially on the fraud side where again, this happens at every level and then you only end up persecuting on the lowest level and never at the higher level. So I guess I kind of have like a little bit of sort of like a make... I'm not fully sure what I feel like is the best solution here just because looking historically, I feel like some of the like actual things that people do, I just think about like in the mid-20... In the mid-2000s in Atlanta, there was this um, DJ, DJ Drama who would produce like mixtapes and they were sometimes had unlicensed like songs on it and eventually he ended up getting like raided and then sort of like having a big sort of chilling effect upon that sort of like mixtape industry, that sort of underground mixtape industry, especially in the South. Um, and like sort of, I guess, like the north, like sort of more of the west of the south and the south, the east, sorry, the southeast and the east of the United States, like sort of mixed state culture. And that's like, I don't want that either. So it's kind of like a little hard to know, like fully, like to me, like what is like the best step for it. But I do think it's something that as an industry, there should be more discussion about. I think it should be much more clearly articulated out in the open that like, yes, piracy is happening. Yes, if we can identify the bad actors, we should be doing that. And there should be more kind of like cross collaboration, especially amongst DSPs themselves, to talk about the issues that we are sort of seeing. Because it, because pirate, because like fake streams doesn't behoove a DSP really. Like it doesn't, that doesn't really help a DSP to have fake streams on the platform. It just kind of actually adds like some illegitimacy to, to the platform where it is basically only of interest to the artists, songwriters, and the labels, marketers, like to everyone else, there's a benefit, but the DSPs, there's not really one. So maybe it's again, like something where it's like DSPs and maybe governments need to have more like transparency and more, co- and more conversation. I feel like the other actors kind of have a slightly different incentive to sort of either be for like to be either doing fraud or to be against fraud or to be trying to push against certain kinds of fraud, which is again, going back to the Lucian letter, he is very much eyeing that kind of like stream yeah. farm kind of stuff, but wouldn't be talking about like BTS's fans doing that because it's like, oh, well, that's one of our artists. That, so why would I want them to, I want them to do that kind of stuff and yeah. game the system. And other interesting conversation that can be, it's not the same, absolutely not the same, but goes like just next to the same highway is the, the whole thing of discovery mode. Mm. And all the other kind of non cash compensation that DSPs are giving to right holders in order, what I'm understanding is that right holders are prioritizing uh, market share over paying to artists. So in this sense, like how, because it's something that it was like, it did a soft launch in maybe 2021, 2020, 2020. And now he's having like a more broad kind because every kind of artist can actually use discovery mode. So what's your take on on this part of this kind of non-cash compensation that comes from DSPs towards right holders? I really, I really don't. I really don't like discovery mode for the very, yeah, basically for all the reasons you were just sort of like laying out there, except you just put like a, like a frowny face next to every sentence you sort of said. <laughs> um, so yeah, so with discovery mode and sort of things like it, I, yeah, I'm not super keen on it for the reasons of one, it lowers the pay for artists. It just sort of makes it cheaper for like a Spotify. And also on a very base level, just so if you're an artist, I really want this to be clear. The more that you or your peers use discovery mode, mode, the less effective it will be over time. Because the more people that use it, that means they'll, you will be end up ultimately fighting for more. You'll have to fight and compete amongst yourselves. And you're basically just going to recreate the current system you have, exactly. but you're exactly. paying into it. So it's going to be a new play field. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so that is like something that I like, just always want to be like, because that's not, Spotify would never say that and no one would ever want to say that. But it's like, that's clearly the longer term trend would be that you would have just a new tier where it's like, I release my music, I hope it gets played. Oh, well, I'm not on a late... It's like, oh, so that's one level. Then it's like, oh, I release my music, I pay money to get it on discovery mode. And I'm like, okay, cool. Or I release my music and I'm on a label and they have the connections to get on the playlist and blah, blah, blah. And so like you have these just new tiers, but ultimately that like middle tier is going to be the one where like, oh, actually I may need to pay more 
first discovery month plus plus to actually really get you juiced into the actual recommendations for the people. And then now you're just sort of like creating more layers of stratification than already exists now. So I don't really like it. I don't like it for that reason. I also just don't, I think for like artists, especially whenever you hear an artist say that like this worked for me or this is beneficial, part of me is just always going to be immediately skeptical because I'm just going to say like, yes, it's working for you now because you're at the beginning of the thing not the end of, not the five year down the line version of it, where it's not going to be as effective. And you can just even immediately kind of tell, just if you think about it, it wouldn't be as effective because if you're like, I use discovery mode, if all my five friends used it, immediately you would kind of go like, oh, well, obviously, wait a minute. If you used it and I used it and they used it, then yeah, I guess I probably am not going to get as much out of it because that song that's going to be going to that person all of a sudden is four other people that have that are competing and sort of get in that slot. So I think discovery mode also is interesting because it's something that in the United States, um, the United States House or the lower the lower body of our government has taken a slight interest in. So I actually think even the House member that represents the the um, area where I live has signed like a letter to sort of ask Spotify like, hey, what's going on for discovery mode? Because from their point of view, it looks very much like payola in a very pay for play type situation. So I think it's, I understand why Spotify as a business, again, wants to try to find an additional revenue stream. And this is one that basically opens it up to their entire artist base to pay them more money to promote their music. That makes a ton of sense business-wise. But I do think it is one that for the artist does not have a lot, of, will not have the benefits over time. And then I think even as a company for them, I think it's going to potentially run into sort of more regulatory concerns that like, you could just avoid by not doing the entire project. It just feels like one that like could hit that sort of buzzsaw of sort of government concern pretty easily. And also people don't, people like Spotify as like a platform and as like a thing to listen to music. But I don't think people are like that attached to like Spotify as like a brand that they wouldn't be like, oh, wait, if my favorite artist is testifying and saying that this is hurting them, I don't think that I don't think that the loyalty will all of a sudden defer back to Spotify and in government and also in the United States again for context, we have like a pretty high level right now of animosity towards all tech companies and especially anyone that are not in the US. So I, I think that that's something that like they may end up being like poking something that may ultimately not be to their advantage in the, over the longer term. Even if in the immediate, it makes a lot of sense. I think that like with all these DSP and discovery modalities need to be aware that. Well, they need to be, first of all, like smart and how to use these new tools, because like for the majority of artists and I'm talking about independent artists or like emerging artists, it's already like super difficult to get uh, an income out of streaming, like super, super difficult. Like you need to have like thousands, thousands, thousands of streams just to be, you have to see some, like some money entering into your bank account. So like, I feel that at the end, artists independent artists can just like start using these DSP, discovery mode, Spotify, these are Apple Music as just like tools to just direct or like gain fan a fan base following and then direct them towards all these other models that we have seen, like that will make them get more revenue at the end. You know, like I feel that a lot of artists have this misunderstanding of just focusing on DSPs and streaming and numbers and just like growing, 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 but like do it at the end. Me, I don't like as a manager, I always like try to tell the artist focus on what's going to make us get like an income so that you can live out of your music. Yeah. We, and maybe like streaming right now is not the, 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 the holy grail. It's just like a different promotion tool, let's say. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, I know. I think streaming, it's funny because I don't, because I feel like I want stream, like ideally for me, I want streaming to pay better and to be able to like have it is just not a pure promotional vehicle for our p- p- pure promotional tool. I do want it to be like something where you can have a real income. But I also per the, how we started the conversation, I do also kind of want to be aware that like streaming ex- came up in a very particular moment. And also streaming is, is sort of a thing where like artists, it, it's just like, it's one where like, it's just not super, it's like sustainable to a certain degree, but it's also very much based on sort of the car blanche of other companies just sort of like saying, we're just going to sort of lose money or we're just sort of going to invest a lot of capital into something that may ultimately not be super beneficial to them in the end. So that's, I guess, kind of like the sort of like conundrum that I kind of sort of feel when I do think about streaming, where it's like, I want, I agree, like I want artists to be able to like just make an income and figure out the best mode of it and not think of streaming at the end all be all. But I also want like streaming if it is to exist. And I think 
The other thing about streaming, just to sort of say this, is that it is such a great... I mean, it's such a omnipresent way of listening to music that I sometimes think is like really underappreciated even by like people in the industry in the sense that like when I go outside, all music I hear comes from streaming typically in a way that I couldn't have said 15 or 20 years ago where it would like maybe someone listening to a CD, maybe someone listening to the radio, maybe someone is like listening to like whatever. But if I hear something coming out of a speaker, I always know that's probably being streamed. And thus part of me always wants to be like kind of aware of like, it would be good if we figured out the best way to have payments coming from this sort of omnipresent music model in a way that like is just fundamentally like so much more all encompassing than previous models had ever been. And it will probably continue to be ever so all encompassing just from its sheer ubiquity at, at, the, at the moment. And now that you mentioned it, the whole, and you already mentioned it a couple of times, the free till model that is it, something that, that we are not even considering, right? In, in the whole, at, at least in the US side, in the, uh, side of the market, uh, in Latin America is quite big because, mm. you know, it's free. YouTube is the, the main source of consumption for the Latin American market and also uh, Spotify as 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 it's, as it's with its freemium version is is quite big. Uh, this year at the time it was making partnership with different uh, network companies. So when you bought your fund, you have you had your Deezer account as well. So mm -hmm. it got a lot of of market share there. And but but uh, what we wanted to understand basically is like why it feels like a little bit of a sick bird that is decaying a little bit a little bit over time. And it can not, it, it feels more like burden to the to the whole business model more than than something that could actually help uh, and to solve this whole part of the of the streaming business model. So the thing about it is, I kind of feel like the as based model in certain contexts is probably fine. I, I will say that I think for certain companies, if you have enough scale with subscriptions. You can look at the ads-based model and say that we are losing money, but it is converting enough people to the paid version that it is like still kind of justified and is like kind of fine to do. I think the issue that's sort of starting to become more apparent to me is that like in certain markets, I just don't really see if that's actually working really well. Like so Deezer and their fourth quarter report actually mentioned that they had exited a number of markets. Because they basically were like, yeah, like we aren't really doing well in these markets. So to increase our average revenue per user, we're just going to start exiting some of these markets. And I bet a big, a big part of that reason was probably because they were like, yeah, we can't keep paying these like licensing, like these, like these recording costs and probably some like publishing costs in these markets where we don't really have a clear way of like converting these people into sort of like paid users. And we can't figure out how to keep getting teleco deals to sustain those kinds of users. So I think for like certain places and like for certain places and certain DSPs, I think that que that question and that relationship is is right now being reexamined. And I think it is right now I'm unsure what that is going to look like and how that's going to shake out ultimately. I think Latin America, because of sort of the early adoption of Spotify, the sort of hugeness of YouTube, I think both of those companies probably are like much more invested in Latin America in seeing the like continued growth of that. And I also am going to speculate and think that maybe a number of those companies also are also still very interested in like the labels and publishers themselves want to sort of continue to sort of see these platforms sort of grow and succeed and aren't interested in sort of like hamstringing them to sort of like a point of failure. That is not something that I feel like is the case in maybe a market like India or maybe in other sort of more Middle Eastern and North and sort of African markets where there's still like quite a bit of more frick. And also they just have like so many I mean, India is a funny example because they have like 1.4 billion people that went there, many different languages, many, it's just like such a massive market that like the idea that there could be one streaming service that sort of takes it, that takes it entirely on seems like kind of ridiculous now the more that I actually sort of like think about it. It's like that is basically the equivalent of trying to sort of like say that like the North and South America could only have one platform and it's like, okay, maybe maybe that's actually not quite the same. The, that maybe that doesn't really quite make sense. So in terms of like we've discussed about uh, streaming fraud, we've discussed about the discovery mode, we've discuss discussed about uh, the whole pressing issues that labels are understanding that are coming into the future of the music industry, what could be like the different kind of 
uh, conversations that should start happening to provide a solution. We already, I think we made that very clear that streaming is not going anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. But how can the streaming uh, model shift to make this a little bit more profitable, not only for major players, but across the industry? Yeah, so I think in some ways, I, 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 have a, like, I have a handful of different sort of thoughts on the streaming side, but also then it's a little bit more broadly, I feel like how like artists and just sort of ourselves as music fans, that I also just think myself as a fan often, um, sort of think about this stuff. So I think on the streaming side, I think it would behoove all the streaming services and businesses just to be a little bit more tighter and a little bit more, I don't want to say frugal, but just looking at the thing, it's like, does it make sense to be in these markets? Maybe it doesn't ultimately. Maybe you should be thinking and trying to understand that you run a business where you should be in these particular markets where you're serving this particular audience. And if you understand the audience really well, that means that hopefully you can increase prices with the understanding to them that, hey, we're asking you to pay us more because we want to support your favorite artists and support the songwriters and the folks that are here. And we cannot do that unless you are going to pay us more. We can show you on our, you can look at our financials and say, see, we only are making X, Y, Z. We are paying out most of our money to these people. So please allow us to support it. It's kind of what Bandcamp kind of says in their, in their sort of messaging and talk. And I think it's something that more streaming services can easily, can much more easily adopt and sort of like actually do. But it's just not something that they, and one, it's sort of, I don't know if people believe Spotify when Spotify says that, but I also think that kind of comes from a slight, again, collective, sort of lack of understanding of who's sort of the like, is bad, so not bad actor, but it's sort of like who's really sort of making a lot of the decisions in, in, sort, in sort of some of these conversations. So I think on the streaming service side, I think that's one level. I think the labels, again, also similarly, similarly labels, so publishers, songwriters, all these different organizations kind of historically have never all been aligned. Historically are always yelling at whoever is paying them money to pay them more money. Even if the people that are being asked are like, we can't pay you more, be it radio broadcasters, be it jukebox operators, be it like the people that run restaurants and then have to pay out sort of like have to pay out fees for that. It's like, they're always asking for more money for those people. And obviously it's in their interest to keep doing, to continue to do so. But it is something where I think everyone in that in that sphere also should be a little bit more aware of like the actual real financial sort of hamstring, the sort of like um sort of handcuffs that sort of exist upon these different folks. And then I think a little bit more broadly to take one step back, I kind of do think that we need to also understand that like if over eighty percent of revenue comes from one dark one part of the business, how do we have other parts of the business that are sort of like one sustainable and ones that maybe aren't so like locked into only a handful of firms. This is kind of why, like, in some way, I really get excited when I see physical sales. I do like buying merch. I do like buying things. I do like spending money on music in ways that are not so immediately like tied to like the streaming economy and, and it go and it has to be filtered through those companies. I just think that that is something that like. If that was more robust, I think that would be much better. This does not mean, and I just, I, I know saying this is going to be a slight, not controversial, but like definitely run against some thoughts. It's like, I don't know if that actually means more Patreon subscriptions or more like Twitch like things. I think that kind of model is a good one and can be beneficial in certain contexts, but I actually don't think it fully makes sense. I think the subscription alone ignores the fact that like newspaper subscriptions work because there's subscriptions and also advertising and also they serve a very particular market and even magazines it's like magazines you pay for the subscription but also there's big glossy advertising also sometimes they host events sometimes they have like vacation like um sort of like cruises and stuff that like magazines sponsored back in the day it's like there are like most businesses don't operate with a single like revenue source. Like having a single revenue source for a business is kind of doesn't make sense. And as like an artist having a single revenue source, especially if it's coming from one particular company, is a really dire situation to put yourself in. There's a reason why if you like go to work and you only have one job, the over the centuries, the sort of like solution to that often is people like unionizing and doing stuff like that because they're like, oh, wait, I need power and voice in my workplace. I have to do something kind of like that. And so I think that as like an artist or whoever, you should not be throwing and casting all your lot into one basket. And then also on a slightly more granular level, if you're an artist or part of a scene, I think it behooves you to have a very clear understanding of like, when I make music, where am I going to be playing music? Who are the people that are going to be playing? Where, like, who, like what should, what, what are the venues I'm going to be playing 
playing at? What are the bars I might be sort of going to? Like, are there, who are the radio stations I'm going to be sort of working with? I think this is something that in the United States, I feel like is kind of slightly lost in certain places. And I think in other parts of the world, it's still more robust just because that stuff has not been sort of like as hollowed out as it's been in the U.S. over the, over the preceding decades. And I think if I have any not advice or any thoughts is that like, especially if you are in places where you can still go to your radio station, you know that there are songs that can be broken there. If you know you can still play it, then you like, if you still have some of that other infrastructure to like support it and make sure it doesn't atrophy too much, because then all of a sudden you're just relying on these sort of digital platforms to do everything. And they are just not capable of doing everything. And so like, that's like also sort of one of my sort of like, sort of like thoughts, thoughts there. And then also something that music, music, companies and groups have done for a while is always lobbying governments for, for benefits in all kinds of different directions, be it tax breaks, be it better, better, like sort of like copyright things. If you can't tell, I've been reading a book on the history of American copyright right. early this morning. <laughs> so I've just been in the front, front, front of my head. Um, but it's like, they got like labels and publishers, especially in the US have been like, constantly litigating copyrights for over a century. So I do think it does behoove, and I do think that's why it always behooves artists, managers, or whoever to have their own organization, to have their own trade, like trade groups, to understand sort of the broader sort of environment. So you just aren't alone in this. I think my, like, one of my bigger things over time is just sort of realizing that like having all this technology at your fingertips or just like on your singular phone makes it so you feel like, oh, I can all of a sudden make a pop song and become a big artist just via my phone. But that's actually probably not going to happen. And also, even if it does did happen, that may not actually be the best thing because that means all of the support that you got came from one single thing. It wasn't that you were making music, playing shows, meet, meeting people, having to build relationships and doing all these other things that sort of make music one, enjoyable, but also have it sort of have deeper roots with people versus, oh, my song went viral on TikTok for a week and a half. And you're just constantly sort of chasing the money that you think you should have gotten from that. And by the time you're able to make that money, that song or moment may have already passed and you're just kind of back to square one, but you have a slightly inflated sense of yourself because you did feel like a grip of sort of like fame or attention. It's like, I guess I could say this as like a writer. It's like for like a very brief period. It's like, oh, I like as a writer, it's like, oh, people like like my stuff. They read my things. I get excited and get really hyped. And then as soon as some of that starts fading away, you're like, oh, wait, why? I, I don't think I realized that like that moment doesn't keep going. It's like those are small windows and you can either capture those windows really well. And artists like, again, sorry, my last example is like, there are artists like The Weeknd. So The Weeknd is an artist who's massively popular. But The Weeknd has been massively popular for almost, for like five or six years before he even had a number one song. Like he was selling out, he was selling out like basketball arenas before he even had a number one like hit. And then he got a number one hit and then he's selling out like three at like 50, 70,000 seat arenas. It's like, it's possible to be able to like take like a really big like success and then spin it off into that next level or stratosphere. But I think broadly speaking, that's not the best way to sort of think about stuff. I think you should be much more, a little bit more tactful and a little bit more sort of understanding of what it is you're kind of potentially working with and not assume that you can always be like hitting every, like hitting every pitch out of the park that sort of happens, happens to you. Absolutely. And like, it's, it's crazy because like, like listening to all this conversation, I think everyone can understand that there's not going to be one single solution because it depends on so many factors, like depends on the country and the territory and the type of artists, the size of the artists, the, the streaming platform. So um, there's, there's hundreds of solutions. And I think we don't even have the time to like discuss <laughs> like half of them in, in like 10 episodes, but it's something I wanted to ask you. And I think hasn't been discussed very much in the industry at all. I think, and you touched a little bit on this on, on, on our conversation previously, it's about um, incentives. Like, don't you think maybe uh, instead of trying to get or come with a solution, like a like straight solution or solutions to tackle different problems, don't you feel like right now the industry is lacking more of like correct incentives? Because like, for example, I, I was thinking, and maybe I'm wrong, but mm. I was thinking stream fraud. So people pay for fake streams, but... Does Spotify really don't want those streams or, or for them might be good because they are saying, look, my platform yeah. has more users, has more streams. Maybe they can even charge more per ad revenue. I'm, I'm just making up stuff, but I no, don't yeah, know. Yeah, so, yeah. so maybe, maybe incentives in general in the streaming uh, or in the, in the music industry are not 
aligned correctly? And I think that's a discussion that could be arised more. I don't know if you agree or not, or what are your thoughts? That's a very, that's an interesting point. And actually, I was going to say, so it also depends on which part of the industry. If you're on the live industry, you have very low incentive to see fake streams or to see manipulation Absolutely. of numbers. So, Absolutely. and but I also think this goes back, I think this goes back to in, across the world, how the recording and publishing side interact with the live side or how they don't interact, I think is maybe sometimes a better way to say it. Because on the live side, especially as people get more numbers and sort of get obsessed with like having all these metrics, it's like, oh, I see that someone has 100,000 monthly listeners on Spotify and I see that they have like, 25,000 like 25, listen, listeners in Bogota. And I'm like, oh, well, they should be able to have XYZ number of people come out to the show. And then you have the show yeah. and seven and people no show up. Shows up yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, well, then what? Then over time, you just start dismissing that. And I, that's what's happened over time. Is that like a lot of these metrics that I feel like five or six years ago, people would cite as like, hey, this tells me I can go play here actually are now like, uh, I need actual proof. I need, yeah. I need I can't, like for my business, I cannot have you say you're going to have 250 people to come to the show. You bring 37. That's a massive loss for me. And I cannot run my business doing that. So to your point about incentives, I think that's also something too, where like the live music industry has a hackley, if it could have more of an influence and impact on the recording mm. side and the publishing side, probably could start sort of evening out some of these sort of like misalignments that we see here because on the streaming side, it's just bigger numbers. Where on the live side, it's like, hey, those numbers are great, but I actually need sales and I need those sales to put people into seats and then the people need to be buying things, i.e. drinks, whatever, at my shows to justify this. And I think if there was a more like holistic loop there, then I think that could be a very sort of good, a better way to sort of have some of this stuff. But because those things are so, can feel so far apart, it makes it so like, I feel like that's like a whole, uh, to your point, yeah, a whole conversation could probably yeah. sort of go down. But I think that happens at like basically all levels, be it like, like in like be it stadium tours or even like much smaller bar shows. Like I, I mean, I see that even for like, as to the party that was mentioned, it's like, yeah, it's like we like through the, the, we want to throw the party like a weekend, but we've never thrown a party before. So we got a Wednesday, <laughs> which makes sense. It's like the bar owner's like, hey, you've never done this before. Why would I give you a Friday night primetime slot where we can make it? That, like we expect to make thousands of dollars that night. If you're going to come in and bring us 700, uh, no, you yeah. you get a Wednesday until you can prove it. <laughs> totally, totally. Man. Well, honestly, like I have like more questions, more thoughts about this conversation that I think that we can keep going on and on and on and on. But we want to be mindful of your time, David. So honestly, thank you so much for coming to the podcast, having this conversation to, uh, with us. Uh, I'm leaving the channel to you if you want to plug anything, something that is happening with you right now. And if what if people want to contact you, what would be like the best way to do it? Absolutely. So if you want to contact me, the best way is pennyfractions at gmail.com. That's just, yeah, pennyfractions at gmail.com. I like reply to every email. Well, yeah, unless it's like a really cold, like, um, startup pitch, I probably don't reply to that one. But like everything else, I'll reply. But you do, you do, you do. Yeah. You, you reply. <laughs> I still do. You reply. Yeah, I do this only like a handful. I've never actually replied to them. That's just they were just like straight up. It's like a copy paste. I don't, I won't reply to like a marketing email like that. Um, but yeah, just hit me up there. And then otherwise, yeah, you can just go type in any fractions into Google and you'll, and you'll find, and you'll find my newsletter. You just subscribe to it. And I just want to say thank you so much for having, having me this morning or I guess this one this afternoon. This is a really good conversation i hope you guys have me back on because like i thought there were like at least seven different topics that we could yeah. we could continue to explore definitely definitely well david thank you so much thank you for coming people will leave all the links down on the on the description so you can go and check out penny fractions and for now thank you so much for listening until the very end but guys i'll see you next week then see you next time see bye you, bye see you. Hey, si ya llegaste hasta acá, muchas gracias por escucharnos. No te olvides de seguirnos en Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora o la plataforma digital que sea de tu preferencia. Si te gustó el capítulo, si te gusta el podcast, no olvides recomendarnos a tu grupo de amigos, colegas. Es la mejor manera y la manera más orgánica de que sigamos creciendo esta comunidad. También nos puedes encontrar en Instagram, Facebook, YouTube como 8000 kilómetros Podcast y cualquier comentario, duda, sugerencia para mejorar el podcast es más que bienvenida. Nos vemos en el siguiente episodio.